Hello everybody, so let's get started and we're going to be talking about beneficial interactions. So how um, some species derive benefit from other species. Um, now the first thing that comes to mind is mutualism. Okay, now, mutualism is this idea where there's this reciprocally positive interaction between species. So you have two species and since we're um, you know, you, you know, we're not talking about cooperation here. We're not talking about, um, you know, conspecifics, two individuals of the same species um, interacting. We're talking about different species um, and where both of them derive a benefit. So this cute little example here, of this boy and his dog, right? They're both getting their back scratched. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, why that, that's not the best way to think about this, but um, for right now, let's just leave it as both species getting a positive uh, benefit from the interaction. Now, um, really when we think about it, most of the world, most of the biological world is mutualists, okay? Um, pretty much every plant has a um, mycorrhizae fungal mutualists, um, coral reefs, anything that does a poll pollinate something else, which is a huge number of species. So uh, mutualism is extremely common and it's really been left out of the you know community ecology modeling. There's very few like um, quantitative models. Um, so this lecture is going to be mostly qualitative talking about how these species interact. Um, but uh, it makes for an interesting lecture. Then. So um, where I, I started with mutualism, but really we should kind of think about facilitation, okay? Facilitation is really the overarching framework where we're talking about beneficial interactions. It's a pairwise interaction in which at least one species benefits. So mutualism is actually a subset of facilitation where you have both species benefit. Uh, another way to write, uh, define it is an interaction where the presence of one species enhances the growth, survival, or reproduction of a second neighboring species. Okay, now, a neighboring species means that they're having, it's, there's like a direct interaction between these two species. Because you could, you know, think of these crazy butterfly effects where, um, you know, one species does something and halfway across the planet it affects something else. That's not really what we're talking about here. But um, <coughs> two examples of this uh, classic facilitation from the, uh, it, where we're having neighboring species is foundation species. So this picture here, what we've got is a um, sphagnum bog. Okay, so this is sphagnum moss, and it's um, a, a species that, really um, changes the conditions of the habitat. It's like really common. It makes up most of the biomass of a bog. So it's like the foundation and it sets the conditions for the whole habitat. Uh, then over here, we've got beaver dams. Okay, now beavers are these ecosystem engineers that have a huge impact on the whole ecosystem. They change the ecosystem from a um, you know a stream that's uh, flowing to having dams that have um, flow flowing water, and a bunch of different species then can live there that wouldn't been able to live there before. So foundation species and ecosystem engineers are great examples of facilitators. Commensalism is another as another type of this uh, facilitation where you have unidirectional positive effect. Basically, um, there's a positive effect on one species with no effect on the others, right? Um, so whale barnacles, right? You've got these barnacles here on this whale. Uh, the whale doesn't care, right? These barnacles don't do anything. Um, you know, potentially if the whale was covered in, in barnacles, it might slow down, but um, you know, most whales don't have that many barnacles and it doesn't hurt the, the whale. It's not a parasitic thing. But the barnacles get a place to live and a whole new um, get, you know, carried around to everywhere that they need to go. 
So uh, another example is bromeliads, right? Bromeliads are these tropical flora, flowers that have this um, little space that fills up with water. And there's all sorts of different uh, bromeliads, but um, they fill up with water and they're great places. There's whole little like food chains that go on in there. Uh, frogs use them. Snails use, slugs use them, worms will use them, um, mosquitoes will definitely use them. So um, those, those mosquitoes and those frogs that are living in those bromeliads don't give any benefit to the bromeliad. The bromeliads don't care, um, but it doesn't hurt them either, right? So the animals get a place to live. Um, which is obviously very positive for them, but all the flowers then get no, no effect. Same with like birds in a tree, right? Birds nesting in a tree derive a huge benefit from that, but the tree, it doesn't matter if there's a nest or not. Uh, and same thing with like epiphytes, right? They're just epiphytes are plants that are growing on top of other plants. And, you know, you don't find too many around here, um, but if you go into rainforest, as you get in more humid areas, they're very, very, very common. Rainforest, almost the significant portion of the primary productivity is actually due to epiphytes that are growing on other trees and growing on other plants. Another type then is um, symbiosis. Another type of this, uh, these positive interactions are sim is symbiosis, where uh, the thing that Define symbiosis as a persistent intimate reaction. The word symbiosis means um, living together or life together, right? So um, usually when we use the term um, symbiosis, we mean it to be positive. Uh, most people actually kind of confuse mutualism and symbiosis, uh, but actually symbiosis can be negative. Um, it, so a, a tapeworm living in a person is symbiotic, it's just a, a parasitic symbiosis. Um, so, you know, whether you have bacteria growing in your gut, algae growing in coral, mycorrhizae growing together uh, with the plant roots, um, this little pom-pom crab having a crab with two little anemones on its hands, on its claws, um, you know, those are all the organisms actually living together. But in this case, these are all uh, positive things. The thing is, we shouldn't anthropomorphize too many of these uh, mutualistic react, uh, interactions, right? That boy and his dog that we started off with is a cute picture, but it it makes there there is basically no caring going on, right? Um, this uh, cleaner ass here in the mouth of this fish, whatever fish this is, um, you know, there is no, this cleaner rest is not like doing the fish a favor. It's not trying to protect the fish. It's getting food. It's getting a good thing, right? Um, and then the, the big fish here that's getting its mouth cleaned out of parasites is getting a good thing too because it reduces its parasite load so that its immune system doesn't have to work as much. These are external parasites, so they won't be losing energy. Um, the gills will be cleaned out, basically, of these parasites, so it can uh, transfer oxygen better. So um, the way we really need to think about these mutualistic interactions is reciprocal exploitation, right? So each um, organism is exploiting the other for its own benefit, okay? And... Um, you know, to the point where the fact that when we see a nice red apple up on a tree um, that's nice and ripe and, you know, it's going to be juicy and sweet, um, that the apple tree is doing a really good job of, of exploiting you, right? You pick off that apple off that tree, start eating it, you either throw the core somewhere else or you eat the whole core and eat, eat the seed and then you poop the seed out later and then that seed is in a nice fertilizer pile. So, you know, most organisms that are going to be eating these apples are going to be, or at least, you know, bigger mammals that are going to be eating them, um, are going to be spreading their seeds all around. Now, the apple does not care about you and whether you eat the, uh, the apple or not. Again, it's exploiting you. It's giving you something. I'll give you some sugar, but you've got to take my seeds somewhere else.
So, um, and what we see is that we'll talk about cheating and mutualism later, but um, what we see is the benefits of these uh, mutualistic interactions outweigh the, 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 you know, the potential benefit of cheating, at least in the long term. So when we think about different mutualisms, there's uh, basically four types of mutualisms that we can have. Energetic, nutritional, protective, and transport. Uh, and you can kind of see where most of these things will fit in um, into these four, four things. Now, it's not that, you know, two organisms um, in a mutualistic interaction will both get energetic from each other. It's actually, you know, the other way around, where um, one one player in the interaction gets one of these four things and the other player gets something else that they're basically not as good at. So you can like mix and match these. Um, this hermit crab here is getting protection from the sea anemone that it put on its shell. The sea anemone is getting transported around. Um, so, um, you know, they're getting different things here. You should also realize that it's, um, you can have more than one of these potentially going on um in each each example so uh let's talk about energetic mutualisms um this is where the uh one player in the interaction obtains energy from another okay so classic example you know just strawberries right let's say you got a bear that's gonna go out and try to eat some wild strawberries um what that bear is looking for is um, to get some get some energy to get some calories, so it eats those berries, gets some calories from those berries, um, and um, the what does the strawberry get out of it? Well, the strawberry gets some transport of its seeds to other places. But um, another example then is lichens. Lichens are a symbiotic uh, relationship between algae and a fungus. Now the fungus will grow on a hard substrate, oftentimes rock, can be on buildings, can be on dirt, uh, can be on wood. Um, and the fungus will gain, um, either grow into the rock or the wood and start decomposing that material or breaking down that material if it's rock or something and grab the nutrients from, from its substrate, also from the air. Um, and then the algae gives the, the lichen energy, the uh, sugars, basically. So it's algae undergoing photosynthesis. So, um, you know, it doesn't look super green, but it, it is green enough, right? So there's photosynthesis going on. So that algae are donating energy to the relationship. And um, the fungus then is donating essentially nutrients, right? And that brings us to nutritional, um, where you have a transfer of nutrients. And we're not talking about like sugars, carbon. We're not talking about energy here. We're talking about nutrients. So that'll be um, oftentimes nitrogen, phosphorus, and vitamins. So uh, our gut bacteria are a great example of this, right? So we have a bunch of bacteria that live in our large intestine, and those bacteria then provide a lot of the um, micronutrients that we need. Um, most of our vitamin K comes from uh, gut bacteria. Uh, bacteria that are living in our large intestine. This is why when a um, young baby, or what, when a baby is born, they'll oftentimes get a vitamin K shot because uh, babies essentially have a completely sterile intestinal tract. And vitamin K is really important for hemorrhaging. hemorrhaging um, and it can potentially, lack of vitamin K, K can cause hemorrhaging in, um, in your brain. And, you know, babies with, that lack vitamin K, especially if they don't eat for a while uh, and start getting those, um, those bacteria growing in their gut, they, um, they can suffer these bad things. And then that's why we do a vitamin K shot. So we can give them a vitamin K shot before those bacteria can colonize um, or, you know, for that intermediate time for when those bacteria are colonizing the large intestine. Uh, but once they get colonized, then they're going to be giving the, the person a lot of um, vitamins. 
Another example of this nutritional um, mutualism is mycorrhizal fungi. Okay, so um, pretty much every plant, almost every plant, and now some of them don't have mycorrhizae, but they have um, a fungus that grows in with the roots. Okay, and that fungus is really good at grabbing um, grabbing those nutrients and passing those nutrients on to the plant. The plant then grows and gives a bunch of sugars, and sometimes it can be up to like 50 to 75% of their sugars actually to feeding the fungus. But um, the fungus then is what we're talking about, allows the plant to grow better and giving it, giving the plant all the nitrogen and phosphorus that it, it, it basically needs. Another type of mutualism is protective. Right, so this is where one player in the mutualism is actively or passive, passively defending the other player. Okay, so the bullhorn acacia, that's what um, we got right here. Uh, it has these big horns that these ants then chew into the horn, and that's where they have their colonies. They have their eggs and their larvae in, in the actual horn, um, thorn here. Um, and what those ants are doing is they're protecting the plant if there's um they don't allow other insect herbivores on there so if like a caterpillar were to be found in the plant those ants will attack it and kill it um they can actually bite mammal herbivores uh and they actually clip um uh, grow they, they keep a space clear around the the acacia plant so that um it gets the most sun so these ants are protecting this, um, this plant. <coughs> They're protecting their home. Uh, the clownfish and sea anemones, right? The anemones are actually doing the protection here. Um, but this is one of those occasions where um, the, you know, the, the, the sea anemone is actually protecting Nemo, but Nemo uh, is actually also protecting the sea anemone, anemone from other fish that might come up and try to eat eat the anemone. Um, uh, the, the little Nemo's also then poop around in, in their anemone and the anemone eats, gets, drives nutrients from that poop. Uh, these are nurse plants here and we can see that um, this bigger tree here is shading and protecting and allowing for seedling growth of, of it is basically protecting uh, the, the small underneath from the harsher conditions of the desert. And we find these commonly in arid areas. Uh, now the last type of mutualism then is transport, okay? Where the uh, one of the players is moving around either the organism itself, the other, the other player in the mutualism itself, their gametes or their propagules. So um, this king crab here is bringing this anemone around. Right? The anemone is protecting the crab, but for the movement part, what we're talking about is that this, this crab is moving around the anemone. Bear poop, right? This is bear poop has a bunch of seeds in it. What has this bear been eating? A bunch of berries. Um, and those seeds then are going to be transported all over the forest as that bear is pooping, right? And it's not just bears. It's pretty much any animal that eats fruit is going to have those seeds are going to be going into that poop and then be moved around and dispersed around. And then anything, the prop, uh, sorry, the gametes, right? The propules are the seeds. The gametes are the, um, in this case, the pollen on this, this bumblebee here. This bumblebee is covered in pollen, right? And it's going to be transporting that pollen, transporting those gametes all over the So that's the four types of mutualism, but we can also kind of group these uh, group these types of mutualism in a different way, which has to do with generalists and specialists. Okay, now generalists are um, organisms that are in a variety of mutualistic interactions with a bunch of different species. So a honeybee here, right? A honeybee can pollinate clover. It can pollinate an apple tree. It can pollinate a dandelion, a sunflower, almond trees, you know, all sorts of different stuff. Um, and 
Same with this flower here. This flower might also be pollinated by a bumblebee. It might also be pollinated by a butterfly. So, you know, uh, the flower is giving out nectar and it doesn't really care who comes and eats the nectar as long as it pollinates, right? So that's an example of generalists where um, there's, you know, one, one species can um, have an interaction with a bunch of different species. The next thing then are specialists. Uh, specialist mutualists are uh, organisms that have a very tight relationship with only uh, one species. You know, probably one of the most famous examples is the star orchid and this hawk moth. Okay. What this star orchid does is it has this nectaring. Um, basically, you know, if you look in this flower, the nectar is just right under here at the base of the flower. But in the star orchid, the nectar is only way down at the tip, way down here. So you're, you basically have to figure out a way. You, you can't crawl, crawl down that. Um, to get the nectar, you need to have a super long tongue or a super long straw. They can get down there and suck that up. And there's only one species of hawk moth that does this. I believe these plants are in Madagascar, by the way. And there's only one uh, species that can do this, and it's this hawk moth that has this like 12 inch tongue that can do it. And um, basically, because that 12 inch long tongue is so long, it can't, this is the only type of thing it can feed from. It can only feed from star orchids, and the only thing that's going to pollinate the star orchid then is this specific hawk moth. So these organisms have co-evolved together such that, you know, if one goes extinct, well, the other one is going to go extinct too. Um, another way to split up mutualisms is by thinking about obligate versus facultative. Now, obligate means it's required, right? The organism will die without the mutualism. So like us and our vitamin K. So we need that our large intestine to have all those bacteria that give us that vitamin K. If we don't get that vitamin K, we will die. Um, it's a necessary nutrient. Um, and so we are obligate mutualists with these bacteria that are living in our gut. Um, those bacteria don't live anywhere else other than the human gut. Um, so for them, it's, you know, this for sure, you absolutely need this um, it's required, right? Without these species, both both players in the interaction will die. Um, leaf cutter ants are another example. Now we're not talking about the the interaction between the ants and the leaf. We're actually talking about the ants um, and this fungus. Because leaf cutter ants, what they do is they got into um, rainforests. They're most common in rainforests, but we can find them in the continental U.S. Just not in the huge numbers that you do find in rainforests. Um, now, what they do is they go up into trees, cut down all these little leaves, and if you ever watch uh, leaf cutter ants, they're pretty amazing at the, how fast they can defoliate an entire tree. But they cut down the leaves and then bring them back to their nest. They chew up the leaves and make them into a pulp and stick it on their fungus, this fungus colony that they grow. And the fungus colony um, is the only food that these um, ants will eat. And the fungus can only grow in the presence of leaf cutter, cutter ants. Without, without either player, both of them go away. So uh, there are these obligate uh, mutualisms. But you can have facultative mutualisms too, where um, organisms do fine without the, uh, you know, the mutualistic interaction, but um, they probably do better when the mutualism exists. Okay, so an example here is plants and mycorrhizae, where uh, plants get the water and the nutrients from the fungus, but the fungus then gets sugars and a place to live from, um, from the plants. So this is a plant, I'm not sure what type of plant it is, but it doesn't really matter. Um, this is the plant with the mycorrhizae, and this is the plant without Another example with the mycorrhizae without, you can see here that above ground root mass, I mean, this plant just doesn't look like it's doing very hot, right? Um, and the, the root biomass of these grasses here is really low compared to what we see with when, when they do have the right mycorrhizae. So, you know, plants can live without this fungus, but they better when they, when they have. 
Now, I think it's um, most attention is paid to these leafcutter ants and these clownfish because they're such cool, such super tight associations that these specialized things, um, specialized interactions, you know, they're interesting to study. They're, the behavior around them is cool. You know, why would ants be cutting down trees so that they can grow a fungus? Isn't there certainly a better food that they could use, right? But um, all the attention is paid on these really um, historically, um, you know, obligate specialist types of interactions. But, I mean, ecologically speaking, uh, the generalist associations are just as important, uh, if not more, right? Um, from, if, if you have an obligate specialist relationship, well, that, you know, kind of limits your interaction between just these two species, right? Now, you could make a case that leafcutter ants do a big um, job of clearing out forests and increasing light penetration and all sorts of things uh, that affecting the forest. But, you know, how much does a clownfish living with a sea anemone really matter? Uh, you know, in the large-scale ecological scheme of things, not that much. However, all the generalist associations between every single pollinator and every plant, between any plant that ever makes a fruit um, that gets eaten by an organism, that is these generalist um, potentially facultative mutualisms that are super important. Um, and they're, they're, you know, from a completely, a, a wider ecological view, it's extremely important to have these um, interactions. Otherwise, they just don't, um, you know, our e ecosystem wouldn't work. Most plants get uh, pollinated by, by animals. So, um, these facultative generalist mutualisms are extremely, extremely important. So you, you might ask the question, well, when do we expect mutualis uh, mutualisms to evolve? And what it has to do with is when you have a cost difference between acquiring the resource yourself versus have some, someone else do it, right? So when the, the cost of acquiring a resource differs between two different species, and it has to do with the relative cost. Um, and it's, it's essentially that idea of why work hard at something if someone else is better than you at it. So, and you can just trade with them. Okay, so the example here is um, the mycorrhizal fungus and a tree. Okay. So the tree is really, really good at creating sugars. That's what it does. That's what photosynthesis does. It creates sugars. It creates energy. It harvests light energy and puts it into chemical energy. Fungus uh, is not very good at making sugars, right? It can't do that. It needs to um, get those sugars from somewhere else. But what fungus is really great at is soaking up water and soaking up nutrients from all over the um, the ground and underground in the habitat, right? So, um, what we see here that you know a, a plants can grow without mycorrhizae, but it's so much easier for them to just trade some sugar to get that water and that nutrients. Now, what we see though is the interaction can change to being negative depending on the context. Okay. So even if we think see these nurse plants, okay, nurse plants are um, really good for the seedlings that grow underneath them, okay, and there uh, most of the little seedlings underneath here wouldn't probably have uh, germinated and grown um, had the nurse plant not been above them, protecting them, uh, protecting them from the high evapotranspiration rates. But then as those seedlings grow up, they're going to have to complete, compete with an already established plant. So depending on the life state of the, the seedlings underneath the nurse plant, it might be, a, you know, start out as being a commensalistic relationship. But afterwards, later on, it might be a competition kind of scenario. Another example is um, 
crayfish. Now, if you look at crayfish, go out and catch a crayfish. Oftentimes, you'll, what you'll find, they're very hard to see, but um, check it out. They'll have these little tiny worms that grow on them, that live on them. Um, those oftentimes be around the cephalothorax. And what they kind of do is go on the outside and then oftentimes go underneath the, the carapace. And they can eat um, the stuff that's growing on the shell of the crayfish. Uh, but they also um, go inside and kind of uh, nibble at the, the gills. Um, and if the crayfish has just like a couple, uh, I forget what the threshold is. It depends on the species. It also depends on the species of the worms. But um, these the, the crayfish actually grow better when they have a low number of these parasites. Um, maybe I shouldn't call them parasites at that point. I should call them mutualists at that point, right, when there's a low number. Um, as the, the, they get higher numbers of these worms, then um, those worms will go into their gills and start like basically eating their gills away. Um, and at low numbers, the, the low number of worms actually allow for more oxygen to pass through those gills. Um, be, uh, and the, the crayfish can then grow faster and it has an easier time extracting oxygen. But when there's all like a bunch of these uh, worms, it turns parasitic where the growth rate of the crayfish actually decreases with more worms. So um, depending on you know the population dynamics within the population of these specific worms on one, one crayfish, it can change that from a mutualistic relationship to a parasitic relationship very easily. There's this other really cool phenom phenomenon called uh, pollinator facilitation. So when you, if you think about, um, you know, a, a wide prairie that has a bunch of prairie flowers, um, you get um, species blooming all at the same time and you might think that you know the more colors and the more flowers you have out there the more probable that a hummingbird is going to come to that spot the more probable that you're going to hear the buzzing of bees around right and um that's because you know the, the wider the bigger the patch of flowers the more pollinators you're going to get so you know one the whatever species of flowers these are, the blue species is helping out the yellow species, is helping out the red species, because, you know, as they're all blooming together, they're going to all attract pollinators better. But, you know, at some point it might be, well, are they competing, right? If you have a whole bunch of flowers in here, there might not be enough, enough, um, enough pollinators that actually... Um, so the pollinator can essentially choose where it wants to go. So these individuals might actually be um, competing, you know, some high density. But what we see is, you know, this is the reason um, this is uh, this pollinator facilitation is happening is because, you know, as you increase bee abundance, you get more seeds per plant, right? The more pollinators you have, the more uh, fecundity you're going to get essentially with um, a, with all all those uh, with all those pollinators. So uh, this kind of brings us to this uh, cheating. Okay, um, do organisms actually cheat when they're talking uh, uh, when they're in this mutualistic relationship? Do they try to get something for for nothing? And the answer is yes, we, we see this all the time. Um, there are what we call parasitic floral mimics, um, and this will, um, uh, the, what it is is that like in this mixed species of wildflowers here, there might be some that actually just don't give any nectar, okay? They still get pollinated because the bee is going around and be like, oh, look, a pink flower goes to it, doesn't find any nectar and flows, flies away. But when they go to the, they find another species, you know, another individual of the same species and be like, oh, look, a pink flower. And then they go to it and they pollinate it, right? They're not getting any nectar, but because they're in this environment where you have all of these flowers, most of them giving nectar, um, you know, they, they 
they can get pollinated, but don't give that reward. They don't have to waste the energy in creating that um, nectar, which is energy intensive to create. Um, so what we see is they're in relatively low prevalence, um, and they're just not that, um, they're maintained at a low, um, low numbers just because they can't have that many. Like think of, you know, the majority of these flowers were these floral mimics that we're not giving the nectar, well, the bees are not going to come to that place because, right, they're going to get sick and tired, essentially, of not having, um, getting nectar. There's, there's another really cool relationship with these plants, and these are plants, they're not green, but they have no chlorophyll, they do not photosynthesize, they're called ghost pipes. Um, and what they actually are, are, uh, over time, what we've seen is that they've become parasites on mycorrhizae. So you'll have these ghost pipes extracting nutrients, extracting energy, sugar and nutrients, I should say, from the mycorrhizae, and those mycorrhizae are, are getting parasitized then. But then the eventual energy comes from like the tree that these ghost pipes are basically living under. Um, and they can get these um, it's just this really cool plants that actually don't don't photosynthesize. So it's a cool example of this like long-term evolutionary like cheating strategy. And there's quite a few species of these. So they do live in Wisconsin, uh, but they also um, they're you know they're found worldwide. So you might get to this like point where well why don't organisms just cheat all the time? So if you think about it from um, a individual level, you might think that natural selection would favor cheating. And organisms are cheating all the time. They are trying to, um, you know, get something for nothing. Uh, the, you, so you might think that the more an animal cheats, the higher it could have its fitness because it gets a reward for not having to make an investment. But you, but you know, the other way around from that is that, that natural selection is also selecting for defenses against cheating. So individuals um, might cheat, but at the population level, there's um, defenses all the time being evolved to, to stop that. Now, a great example is the yucca moth and the yucca plant. Okay, so this is the yucca plant and these little moths here are, uh, it, sh it should be said that these are an obligate specialist, right? So the yucca moth can only get um, pollinated by these moths, and the yucca moth's only food is then the, um, the seeds inside the yucca flower. Okay, so what happens? Yucca moths will go out looking for yucca flowers. They will go there and they'll pollinate it. Um, uh, move pollen around from yucca plant to yucca plant, right? And they'll be then depositing their eggs at the base of the flower. And what that, those um, eggs then, the flower will close up when it's, you know, done doing its flower thing. The flower will close up and um, produce seeds. And all that time, those larvae are growing and eating those seeds. And um, so... It's, it, there's this really cool relationship and there's this like interplay, right? Where the plant is giving up some fitness, it's giving up some of the seeds so that the yucca moth can eat those. Um, and then you could think about it from the yucca moth's point of view. Well, the yucca moth is not putting in very many seeds, very many eggs, I should say, into each flower. And so this graph is really interesting here where what um, what you see here is the number of moth eggs deposited in each plant, in each flower, and how many, what percentage of those flowers are actually re retained to maturity. So basically, how many of those flowers grow and develop and produce seeds. And what we see is once you get above six eggs that are growing in there, you get so you get like six larvae. Um, basically, what the, the plant does is it self-aborts. 
it kills those flowers off. So um, what that means then is those moths that are feeding and putting too many eggs into that flower, they you know, so that's, they're over here on, on the right of the x-axis are, they're not getting very, very many of their eggs to adulthood because most of those flowers are going to be aborted by, by the plant. Um, so the moths that only lay a couple eggs, the chances that that flower is going to go to maturity and thus those larvae will grow to maturity and create new moths is much, much, much higher. And what we see then is the, um, the you know, it's maintained that most of these eukin moths only lay about a maximum of six eggs in each flower. So you see there's defenses for this cheating and um, so that these eukin moths are not just cheating all of the time. All right, so that's it for the mutualistic uh, lecture. Uh, with that, I'll see you later.